things that have been submitted by grassroots groups all around Wisconsin uh, for these folks. And so I'd like to get a, a round of questions in, um, starting with um, a question from Diane Hasselbein. Hasselbein. Hasselbein from, from Middleton Action Team. And her question for you, Kathleen, is Wisconsin has extreme polarization with Scott Walker refusing to talk with any of those in the minority. If you were elected governor, would you try to work with the Republic, Republicans on any issues? Thank you. Um, and again, I've got a long track record. I know when you fight, and I know when you got to reach agreements with people. And let me give some examples. You know, I spent 20 years as the environmental lawyer helping citizens all across the state. And uh, when you and Dane County elected me county executive 15 years ago as the environmental advocate, remember it was against Mike Blaska at that time? Mm -hmm. And Governor Thompson had been helping Mike Blaska at that time. Um, I knew that I, we had two choices of how to move forward. I can either be the environmental warrior county executive and we'll be fighting the realtors and fighting the builders and you know the interest on the other side and on any given Thursday night they may win and on any given Thursday night we may win. But meanwhile, Rome is burning. Dane County is growing by 60,000 people a decade. And while we quarrel on a Thursday night, we're losing the county to sprawl unless we do it a different way. And so I thought my job for you was to get the job done and protect our county. So the day after the election, I called the realtors, ding-a-ling-a-ling, -a -ling, called the builders, ding-a-ling-a-ling, -a -ling, and said, I'm calling not to gloat, just the opposite. I'm calling to ask for you to give me a chance to work with me because people just elected me because of the vision here of protecting our county fighting sprawl, cleaning up our lakes, protecting our farmland. Will you give me a chance? And they said, okay. They were stuck with me for four years. But they said, okay. So then my job was to find a way to get us to work together where people don't have to give up their highly thought views, because who wants to, right, Jim? But I knew that if you asked people in Dane County, including the realtors and builders, what they wanted our county to look like, then we'd want the same thing clean lakes and streams, strong farms, great 60 different communities of all different sizes. So my job was to get us there. So just to finish the, the example, I want to respect time constraints. 15 years ago then, picture there was nothing more divisive in Dane County than land use and growth issues, nothing. And so I opened up the Align Energy Center, Exposition Hall, you've all been there, Million, many, many round tables uh, set up, opened it up for a public hearing, and Jim, you probably were there, and many others, and some in this room, and just said, come on, we're going to talk about land use. And so people from Card Carry, Sierra Club, and the other side came. And they'd all sit down on these round tables. And I put a map of Dane County in the middle of every table with a bowl of M&Ms and said, don't eat them yet. Then, and I knew the Card Carry and Sierra Clubber would sit next to the rabbit developer because then they could kind of needle each other because that was what happened all the time. And so I said, OK, now everybody put the M&Ms on the map of Dane County where you want the development to happen. Well, they're ready to go, right? They put the M&Ms, and they're putting them in the same place. And they looked at each other like they had never seen each other before. <laughs> because but for our philosophical differences, we, weren't, we were forgetting we wanted the same thing. And so then my job was to now find something for us to work on together that reflects that, that both sides will feel proud of. And so I came up with the idea of the conservation referendum. I knew you'd vote for it in a heartbeat. I knew you'd vote to tax yourselves more. But what it did was it had both sides working together on the same thing, getting it done. And at that night, I'll never forget election night in spring of 99, when we're all standing there at this strange alliance of folks who didn't normally agree on the day of the week. They said, OK, Paul, now what do you want us to do? And out of that came the next 12 years of the first, the only, or the best environmental protections in the state and some of the best in the country. And that's how I got it. Okay, the next question comes from Dick and Sheila Plotkin of Active McFarland, and this is for you, Harry. TV ads for politicians tell half-truths or outright lies. Walker has unlimited funds for such ads. Can we offset them with citizen boots on the ground telling the truth? 
If you believe we can, how? I think we can, the truth remains truth and truth is eternal. And that remains the fact. So I think we can overturn the political ads and the falseness by simply telling the truth, but using people as our voices, using social media, using you know, internet, and using uh, en engaging community, just like we are doing here, and engaging grassroots organizations, and engaging people throughout the state. It will be necessary to place correctly, surgically placed ads and just like he is doing, but not as wide is because maybe it's probably going to be difficult to compete, to state the facts. And I think people are reasonable, people will accept and understand fact-based information that's provided. Okay. Um, this is also from the Middleton Action Team, from Kathy Stella. Um, and this is for you, Kathleen. Um, assume Walker loses his recall election, and soon both the Senate and the House become controlled by Democrats. In what ways will you govern differently than Walker? Please give specific examples. Well, the first thing I would do is talk with all of the people of the state, not just the people that elected me. I, I think one of the things that was most frustrating for us when we were in Illinois was that over and over again we asked the governor to talk with us and offered solutions and he would give the illusion that he was talking and then 15 minutes after his people got off the phone he would be in front of the cameras in Madison saying that he, he was absolutely not going to negotiate. So it's, it's a dishonesty, it's a disingenuous approach. What, what we need to do is bring people together and begin the healing that has to happen. And I think the best way to do that is to create as open a process as possible. A lot of the very bad things that have happened have happened late at night in rushed bills in ways that people were not involved in the process. And a perfect example, of course, is what's happened this week with the Mining Committee, the dissolution of the Mining Committee and no hearings at all. And, and when, there were, when there were hearings even scheduled, the, the, when I talk about the the following the process. The process is there, it's very important. And if we bring everybody to the table and work out our differences, everybody, and I'm not just talking about the people that you agree with, but everybody. If we bring everybody together, that process takes time. And especially with a big bill, whether it's Act 10 or the mining bill or, or all of the other issues, healthcare, all the other issues that we have to deal with. It means a governor who's willing to go out in a forum like this and have town hall meetings and have a discussion among the people about what the people want all over the state, not just in Madison. And I, I do believe that if Senator Miller has this, this saying that I'll, I'll borrow from him, that he says that the public process is so important that you have to think of legislation as like fish. You have to open up the wax paper and let it sit on the table and let the sun shine on it and see if it stinks. <laughs> And we're not all going to get what we want, and I, I fully expect that I'm not going to get all the legislation that I want in exactly the way I want it. But the most important thing is that there is harmony. And harmony, think about harmony. Harmony means we're not all singing the same note, but we're all in tune together. And that can happen by bringing people into the process and respecting the rules. here um, I have a question that I would like to ask all the presenters but I would like to give a few moments to Mr. Charles Uphoff that he could talk to you because he has a very unique idea. I'm probably the only one up here who's going to tell you I'm not running. <laughs> uh, I, I did have s some uh, invitation to think about it. A good friend of mine John Nichols had suggested I think somewhat to my cheek but somewhat seriously too about running as a progressive in the Republican primary. Um, <laughs> it, it, was, uh, it, was an intriguing, it was an intriguing idea. One of the things that 
I found particularly interesting, I don't know how many of you had a chance to look at the Blue Book. <coughs> There's a wonderful section on Wisconsin's progressive history. And I was astonished as I started reading to discover in 1911 a Republican legislature with a Republican governor with the assistance and support of Democratic Socialists from Milwaukee passed progressive income tax, regulation of the railroads, workers' comp, recall referendum, and initiative some of the most sweeping of progressive legislation in the history of this country. And I thought, now that's my kind of Republican. <laughs> But, you know, I, the other thing that was a very formative experience for me, I served for a time as coordinator of the Wisconsin Governor's Conference on Children and Families under Lee Dreyfus. And we had over a thousand delegates from all over the state, all the two of Wisconsin's 72 counties that came to Madison for three days, mostly at their own expense, to talk about issues related to children and families. And the second week I was on the job, I got a visit from a group of young of ladies from a group called Eagle Fork, Village Lapley group. It's uh, sort of way off there on the right. And they were quite upset. They felt they'd been shot out of a conference two years earlier. And uh, they want to make sure that didn't happen again. So, I said, so what committee would you like to serve on? Which took a little wind out of the sail. I said, of course, you understand that we want to make this conference genuinely representative of the diversity of families in Wisconsin. So, of course, we want you to be involved, but we're going to be asking a lot of people who have, may have very different opinions from you to be involved as well. Can you live with that? And we put it together an outreach committee of 35 people, sent out 38,000 mailings to garden clubs and Kiwanis and groups all over the state. We had over 8,000 people who had applied to attend a three-day conference at their own expense. And we were able to sort of winnow it down to 1,000 delegates using a computer program to match the demographic and the people who would apply with the congressional districts that they came from. But the point is this, what came out of that was really a, a revelation, an, an encouraging one. And that was that when you sit people down, and you ask them to take off the labels, and you ask them to talk about what do we need to do, and why are we doing it now, on a lot of issues there's fundamental agreement. People want good jobs, good schools, safe communities. They want affordable health care. They want a clean environment, and they want fair taxes. And that's almost universal across the spectrum. So the real question is, why aren't we getting it? And I, to, to sort of uh, summarize and sort of get to the point here, the reason, I guess, that I have decided not to throw my head in the ring <laughs> is, for me, the bottom line, most fundamental thing is giving the current governor a pink slip. I think we need to... And so, basically, after giving us some thought and some consideration, and there were parts of it that were frankly appealing, the idea of being able to really confront Scott Walker on a number of the issues was certainly an appealing thing, but bottom line is, I think we need a new governor here, yes. someone who can, who can win. And I think uh, my concern in running an independent candidacy or even as a progressive in the Republican primary is that it might take away some resources and some time and some energy from one of the candidates, hopefully one of the candidates up here, who we hope and expect to win and to be our next governor. Um, the bottom line is, I think when you're thinking about voting, when you're thinking about election, you need to think about this. It's not about me. It's about you, it's about our families, it's about our kids, it's about our grandkids. It's about the kind of future, the kind of um, state, the kind of country, the kind of world we want to leave for them. And I think one thing that everybody shares in common as well, Across the spectrum, I think everybody wants to be able to turn over their kids and grandkids a world that at least as good as the one they inherited. And there's a real fear, I think, left and right across the board that we're not going to be able to do that. I think that's part of the challenge. I think we need to work together. We need to push. We need to be clear. We need to have transparency in everything we do. And we need to make sure that everyone understands that democracy is not a spectator sport. Okay? Thank you is a fun but very short run. <laughs>